During the break, uh, I was told, why do, do you use uh, the representation greater or equal to and uh, not less or equal to? And uh, there was one uh, thing that I wanted to show you. One of the reasons, typically, suppose you have uh, a clause with 10,000 literals, okay? The way you are going to represent it with uh, greater or equal to one is your, the sum of the 10,000 literals greater or equal to one, okay? Now, if you want to represent that uh, clause with less or equal to, you are going to use the sum of the negation of the literals is less or equal to 10,000 minus 1. So you see, there is no free lunch. I mean, you use one representation. So typically, that greater or equal to is the best representation if you need to go from clauses to something uh, different. So that, again, the clauses in that representation are really the, the best thing uh, you can have, right? So, uh, yeah, it has been, so if it's the case, it's not just by chance, but it's, there is really a reason why uh, it is the case. So, should I go back to that example? All right, so here we are going to try, uh, we have, our three cardinality, uh, three pseudo-Boolean constraints. And so this is the notation x5 has been assigned false at decision zero uh, here. It doesn't look uh, right because it should, uh, oh, so no, no, not x, not x5, uh, 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 so this is here. Then x1 has been uh, assigned by propag, so if you remove that one, uh, what does it mean? So we have uh, 3 plus 2 plus 2, this is only 7. Uh, so you need absolutely to uh, propagate x1 because x5 has been removed. Okay? So here, you have, if you remove x1 by default, you see that you have 3 plus 2 plus 2 plus 1, which is 8. So by default, when you read that constraint, x1 is not necessary. But as soon as x5 is falsified, you need to propagate x1. This is what you have here. Then, uh, so at decision uh, level zero, the, the first decision made is x1, and then you propagate uh, is x5, not x5, and then you propagate x1. Uh, the second decision is uh, not x4, not x4, and you are going to propagate x1, x3 here, thanks to this, which is written here. And because you are propagating uh, x1, x3, x1 and x3, this is falsified. Uh, so we are going to, so x4 is uh, falsified, so now you have to propagate uh, these two, and then you have uh, falsified this one, uh, and uh, these two, and this is falsified now. So, uh, if you look at what is, uh, uh, what is the value here? Here you have 5 plus 3, 8 plus 2. Okay, so you are satisfying with uh, an addition of 2 uh, your, um, uh, your threshold. Okay, and now if you look at here, you have only 3 for the second one, so you are missing 2 to uh, reach your threshold. So now what are you, so what you need to combine C2 and C1, okay? Uh, on uh, the, the last one, which is X2, okay? We have the same, uh, uh, the same weight, so that, uh, that's fine. So uh, what we are going to uh, to do, we are going to uh, weaken on x1, okay? So now we are going to have this, uh, this formula here, 3x2 plus 2x3, and we reduce here uh, uh, the threshold, and you see that just weakening doesn't change at all the, what we get. We still have, uh, by, we, we satisfy with an addition of 2, uh, this formula here. And so plus 2 and minus 2, I forget to, to tell, is equal 0. So your equal 0 is not falsified. This is our problem. Okay? 
So because if I combine those two, I will get plus two minus two equals zero, and this, we need something that is strictly less than zero to, to be falsified. So we're going to reduce now by uh, x3, and uh, we will get uh, now that uh, formula. So because it's uh, 3x2 plus uh, x4 plus uh, x5, uh, and now we have that two here, uh, that is removed, which is 1, and because we have the saturation rule, it becomes x2 plus x4 plus x5, okay? And now we go from, uh, because x2 is, uh, is falsified, x4 and uh, x5 uh, uh, are satisfied. Uh, now we, uh, okay, no. No, x5 is falsified, so only x4 is satisfied, so we, have, we are propagating. So now we move from a, uh, a pulse uh, of 2 to 0. Okay. So it means that if I do 0 plus minus 2, now I have something that is negative. So now I will get, get something that is falsified if I combine this one and this one. So, uh, but I have to adapt the, the coefficient. So I have uh, C2 and uh, the first one that has been reduced to, to that one. So I take C2 and three times uh, that one. So C2 is uh, 5x1 plus, uh, so plus 3x2. Uh, so I'm going to remove 3 from uh, the combination of uh, 3, four, 3 times 1, so it's 3, plus uh, 5, it's uh, uh, 8, minus 3. Here uh, I have x4, so it's 3 times x4, plus uh, 2 times x4, x4 bar, so I'm, I'm getting rid of 2x bar. So, uh, okay, I need to, to write it, but... Uh, and then x5, we have 3x5. Uh, so at the end, what we get is we have different coefficients, but because our threshold is 2, we are going to uh, change the, uh, the coefficients of those ones. Okay, So we get that, uh, that pseudo-boolean constraint. And if you, you look at it, uh, we, we can go back to the first decision level, and uh, in which case we are going to uh, propagate, uh, because the first decision level we have x5, which is false. So we, if we go back, to, uh, and this has been also propagated at uh, decision level zero. So we are going to, uh, we, we stay with, uh, with those elements, and we have to propagate uh, necessarily x3. So typically, this is the kind of uh, pseudo boolean constraint you could learn. If you do, so if instead of using this, you apply only, uh, you just take the falsified literals, you would, uh, you would get uh, typically that, uh, that clause, x1 bar plus x4 bar plus uh, x5. Uh, uh, and uh, this is also uh, something that is uh, assertive uh, decision uh, zero, right? And in that case, you are going to propagate uh, x4 because this is falsified and this is falsified. Okay. So you, you, when you look at them, uh, you are, it's not really comparable, okay? You, you, are, you learn different, uh, different constraints, but you see that here, you, you have that process where you have to compute typically uh, uh, the slack here for C1 and C2, and if you, you sum up, you are not negative, and this happens a lot of time. You, this is heuristic. Why did I choose X1 and X3? I could have used uh, any unassigned or satisfied literal. Okay? I, I, I cannot change falsified literals. I can change. I can weaken by falsified or unassigned literals. So there is a old combinatorial, uh, we use heuristics. So this is, this is really a problem because there are many ways you can weaken uh, something. And weakening doesn't change uh, anything. 
It's the fact that at some point you will be able to decrease the threshold and you will be able to uh, apply saturation. This is where you are going to reduce uh, the slack. So typically, so it's not directly the rule you are using that is going to allow you to become falsified. It's uh, the consequence by decreasing uh, the threshold that will allow you to do that. So it's a uh, so this is really something that is uh, complicated. So many people try to uh, find ways. So there are, there are cases in, way, uh, in which you do not have to do anything. So if you know that the reason is the cardinality constraints, you do not have to do it. So th there are cases for which it's simple. But if you have two generic uh, pseudo boolean constraints, one conflicting and one the reason of the other, then you have to do some tricks to maintain uh, that invariant. OK, so here I try to put, so I'm, I'm talking about solvers with a specific handling of cardinality constraints or pseudo-boolean constraints inside the solvers. I'm not talking about uh, people doing encodings and uh, calling a set solver, OK? So typically, uh, the, in the 90s, there was some, uh, some work on this, and typically, the first one, uh, so do, do, this one was the DPLL version. Uh, this was a local search based on uh, uh, certain constraints. And then you had the version of GRASP with uh, uh, BSOLO with uh, uh, cardinality constraints and the optimization and so on. And then you see all the papers uh, has been here, typically papers, uh, because of the shaft coming in 2001 and people saying, OK, we're going to do the same thing extending to pseudo boolean constraints with, uh, ear, without changing the proof system or with changing the proof system. Okay? And then, uh, typically, nothing, uh, not much. Uh, so, the, so for WBO, it's a, it's a bit specific because uh, WBO, it's a generalization of uh, MaxSat on PBO. So, uh, uh, and then we have recently some uh, a new solver called rounding set that appears. But typically, most of the work has been done uh, five years after Schaff. Okay, typically a, a huge interest. And typically, what happened is that uh, the main interest is typically on Maxat since uh, a decade ago almost. But typically, we will see that in the real, the, the main, many of the problems that people are uh, uh, um, expressing in MaxSat are actually pseudo boolean optimization problems. But uh, it's just that uh, MaxSat and uh, MaxSat solvers are more sexy now, so they prefer to use MaxSat. But re the, in reality, the real problem they try to solve is typically an optimization function with uh, clauses. And this is uh, not a MaxSat problem. Okay? If you have just unit soft clause, uh, it means that you are solving I'm not saying the, the wrong problem. You can use both approach to do it, but uh, uh, the, the real problem is, is that one. Um, and uh, typically, uh, most of the work uh, since uh, the mid-2000 uh, has been on improving encodings. And this is the reason why it's not seen here. Okay? So there have been huge improvements in encodings. And uh, we will see that. I, I have a, a few results from the set competition, so from the pseudo boolean evaluation. And you will see that uh, uh, it works fine. And typically, just to give you an idea, the first uh, evaluation, PB evaluation in 2009, in 2005, uh, so Niklasen and Niklas Sorensen uh, submitted a, a solver based on the translation of CNF. So there are three different encodings, depending of the, uh, of the PB constraints. It's cardinality and so on. And uh, they were by far the best one uh, to solve decision problems. And it was sort of, a, they, they just submitted uh, just, you know, to, to see how it goes. And uh, it was very, very efficient. And typically, th this is, and one of the reasons is, if you have a very efficient set solvers, you, you can just pick the best one. That, at that time, it was mini-set. If you have a good encoding, you can pick uh, the most recent set solvers and you benefit from everything. And this is very difficult to beat uh, if you have to re-implement and re-adapt uh, for your own constraints, all those things. Uh, and this is also what happens for constraint programming. The reason why the best solvers 
the last two years at the XCSP competition are SAT based is because uh, they just uh, reused later SAT solvers, new encodings, and uh, it works well. Okay, so uh, so what about what about SAT4J in that case? So SAT4J typically we were interested in uh, the PB shaft on Galena. So uh, so so that, that were those were two solvers that were designed right after shaft. But typically, uh, the source code of Galena was not available, and the PB shaft was not maintained. And it was really the idea to uh, change the proof system. So those solvers are uh, generating uh, 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 pseudo-buoyant constraints instead of clauses. And for efficiency reasons, typically, they uh, just keep cardinality constraints inside the solvers. And typically, they, uh, they were not able to work on many uh, uh, problems because they didn't manage overflows. So it was working on some uh, problems, but uh, not on some uh, problems we were interested in. And, they were, uh, and the authors decided to, to do other things. So we uh, decided to have our own PB solver. So SAT4J was based on uh, uh, the Minisat specification. So end of 2003, there was a Minisat specification, a paper describing how was working the solver, and that has been uh, really, so there has been one revolution that has been shaft. All the principles were in the solvers, but most people didn't know really how to implement them. And then the second revolution has been Minisat, because it was 600 lines of C++ code, plus 300 for the libraries. And uh, everybody could understand it, master student could un understand it, and uh, this is how I implemented Set4J. And if, until I, during two years, between 2001 and 2003, I, was, I had in mind that CDCL was just binary research uh, or, or on a tree and learning. This is no, not at all the case, okay? If you believe it, you are wrong. The way it works, it's really driven by conflict analysis, and this is a completely different way of solving problem. And it means that when you do, for instance, a linear search, uh, uh, when you do optimization here, you are not do, you, at all using branch and bound and so on. All those things that you have learned at school, I mean, this is not the way the solvers are, are working. And so in SAT4J, you have two different ways of working. Either you just use uh, the, the classical uh, uh, conflict analysis, and then you have a native representation of the constraints. And when you ask if you falsify something, it will give you a set of literals, just like yesterday for cardinalities, you know. You, you, the cardinality or the PB constraint will give a set of literals to the solver, and the solver will sort of just see literals as if it was a CNF encoding. It just compactly represented in the solver. And there is the um, cutting planes uh, engine that will produce new PB constraints. So what can go wrong uh, if you uh, uh, implement uh, those things? Uh, the Boolean propagation. So now uh, you do no longer have those lazy data structure on LPB constraints. So each time you are learning new, P new constraints, your server is getting slower. This used to be the case in SAT before uh, using uh, watch literals. And uh, so we go back in the state where, uh, when you are learning, you are getting slower and slower. The problem is that there is no easy way to detect uh, that you are assertive. You have to, to check. It's not syntactical. You have to, be, to pay attention to that. Then uh, you have that story that you need to find how to weaken, and uh, there are many ways to do it, uh, to be able to have a conflicting constraints once you apply your co uh, clashing addition. And then you have the problem that uh, after a while, so sometimes SAT4J ends with, uh, di with numbers with uh, thousands of digits. It's, but uh, yes, so this is just, uh, but, but this is what happens if you do not any, any rule to reduce the coefficient. If you just apply the rules purely as they are described, uh, after a while, you have really a huge coefficients, and then the solver spends a lot of time uh, doing manipulation of arbitrary precision arithmetics, and it's, uh, so you are not doing search at all. You are just huge, managing those very huge numbers. So typically, uh, what people have done is typically to uh, reduce uh, 
so it shouldn't be closed. It's a constraint to catalytic. So you just run catalytic constraints. Uh, or if you use uh, sometimes, so that was in Pueblo, you, you keep the PB constraint for a while, and after that, you remove it. So typically, you learn a close and a PB constraint. You keep the PB constraint for a while, and then you forget it. It doesn't change. Your solver is still complete. Okay, the close will allow you to to finish. But uh, so this uh, and uh, so else you just learn uh, that was the, the very first uh, solvers. Uh, so PBS, which is typically like uh, SAT for J, you, where you have an internal representation, but you learn closes or mini SAT plus. Okay, so now. So that was for the generic principle. So we, I've heard someone uh, of the speaker speaking about binary search. So I don't know if it's you. <laughs> so I wanted to give you something because when you play with those solvers, textbooks are no longer the same, right? Uh, and uh, in our case, we are not going to use binary search uh, because it, it doesn't work well. So typically, this is how you are going to solve so with so-called linear search and optimization problems. So because we agree that we are only saying yes, no, and if yes, we are going to provide a model, right? So typically, how do you solve an optimization problem now if you have an engine able to solve a decision problem? Typically, you, you, you are going to have your set of constraints, and you will ask to your set solver, is, it, is the set of sol constraints satisfiable? And you will get an answer. There are two possibilities. If the problem is unsat, you are done. No answer. It's finished. And now you are going to retrieve the model that corresponds to, to the answer, because you know that uh, it's satisfiable. And you are going to add a new, to the set of constraints, a new constraint that is, so the value of the objective function should be better than the current value. And this is where I tell you that uh, where was that? Uh, that we have this k that is decreasing because we are going to have the objective function here, and we have we are going to produce a k that is going to be smaller and smaller and smaller. And and you are going to do to do that just uh, until your, your problem is unsat. And this is where we have our researcher and seeds problem. Okay because there will be a case where you are sat, and right after that, you are unsat. And this is how you detect that it works. R what is the difference between branch and bound? Do I have an initial upper bound? No. OK? Uh, here, I can prove optimality if I am lucky in two calls to the sat solver. I can have a call. Give me a solution. It gives me a solution. And then, I, can I get a, a better one? No. And that's it. And you tell, well, yes, but why would it happen? So typically, sat for j when you ask uh, for a solution, it knows what is the objective function. And it's going to give you some values uh, for the phases that will uh, minimize directly the objective function. So in some real problems, uh, sometimes the users were saying, how is it possible that it finds directly the solution? I say, yes, because sometimes the problems are just simple. You have all the weights of the objective function. You just uh, give that to the solvers, and it will try, and it will work. Something very close, and you cannot do better. So there is no upper bound. There is no lower bound. It's, 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 you are driven by the solver. Yes? So is the solver branching based on the objective function you have, or when so that solver it, is aware of it, the objective function? In the case of SAT4J, because uh, I can do things with SAT4J, so by default, when I read the, the problem here, the is satisfiable is not just the set of constraints, because I, I provide also the objective function, so that it, can, uh, it will branch, it will give the phase depending on the value of the variable in the objective function, so as to minimize. So typically, if the coefficient is positive and you have to minimize, I will give you the negative phase. If the coefficient is negative, I will give you the positive phase. And just doing that, 
uh, it allows you to find, uh, so for some problems, uh, a solution that is very close to uh, the optimal one. But do you also use uh, the magnitude of constraint? Like if something is large, I would run. No, I, I, I do not do that. I mean, maybe there are possibilities to, to do better than what I, what I do, but for the moment, we, we just do that. Yes? You said that binary search is not good. Yeah, well, I will go to that point after, because you, no, a SAT and a non-SAT call, well, a SAT and a non-SAT answer is not the same for a SAT solver. And I, so, but I have a slide on this, okay? Uh, so let me show you the, the thing, yeah. No, but in response to what Kuldeep asked, you're saying that you're already doing some kind of optimization. No, so, okay, le I have a slide on it, oh. so l let me show you. Because m most people do not understand that when you play with solvers, what is important is you need to uh, get the, as many as much information as possible directly from the solvers. The successful application of SAT-based techniques works if you are in deep interaction with the solver, if you are driven by the solver. And um, so, uh, so this is just an example to show that the same example that we showed before. Uh, so we have this objective function, we have those constraints. I ask my solver for a model of this one. So this is sort of a dumb thing because that 4 j will give you directly the, optimization, the, the optimal uh, thing, but for the animation, it's not nice. So I, I pick that model, I evaluate for the objective function. So it, it gives me five. So now it's, I'm adding that constraint to, to my formula. So I'm going to satisfy this now. So, so now I have those, uh, the original constraints plus the objective function constraints. I have a new model, which evaluates to three, which is better than the five, okay. So that's good. I ask for another model and it will find another one, which is one. And uh, now I'm going to ask, is there a possibility to do better than, than one, okay? And it's not possible. So one is, uh, so the, the assignment I got and the, the optimal value is one, okay? So here I am, I've been in the worst case because I had to ask the solver many times uh, to get the optimal uh, solution. But uh, it, uh, it works. And so the, this is my optimal solution and the value objective function is one. So this is a linear search. So why now? Do we have a problem? Okay, so we do not need upper bounds. Uh, you can take uh, a phase selection strategy that takes into account the objective functions. You can use any pseudo balance solver. So this is a nice. And you have that sat, 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 and sat pattern. And the thing is, sat answers are typically easier than unsat ones. And typically, there is even more. If you are sat, you do not have, and you add that constraints, you can keep all the constraints you have learned. As soon as you have unsat, you need to get rid of everything. So there is really a reason why, in that case, a sat call is not equivalent to an unsat call. So if you do binary search, you will have sat unsat calls, and uh, that will be very different. And so in practice, if you do this and you use linear search or binary search, in practice, linear search will be more efficient because you, you keep all the clauses and you do not have uh, to have this problem. So it's really about the, the fact that you do not have the same properties when you, the answer is on that or when the answer is that. Depends on the starting point, right? And the first solution Yes, yeah, so okay. if you have a, a good starting point, so that's, that's the reason why it's important uh, to be able to give that, in some ways, that information to the solver. Um, if, I, if I use any PV solver that may not be able to <coughs> use that, I mean, sat makes use of that. No, but yeah, so that's the reason why I tell you there is always a limit of uh, white box or black box. I mean, uh, uh, so if something works in approx MC and so on, it's also because there is a, a deep connection with the underlying solvers. Because if you want to be efficient, sometimes you need to get the information directly. Uh, 
So yes, so this is, uh, this is a way to uh, be more efficient to get the first uh, model. Uh, that's clear. Uh, and typically, the, the, the issue we have, and uh, this is what I told you uh, when we started the, the, the lecture uh, this morning, is typically you have the pigeon hole or the researcher seat problem uh, exactly for the last call that is on site. And if you are doing resolution, you know that you are in trouble because you, you will have a hard time to prove uh, optimality. If you stay in a case where uh, you translate the canonity constraint uh, without adding variables or using just resolution. So then if you use sophisticated encoding which add variables, it's another story because it might just uh, uh, be similar to extended resolution. So, uh, but, so the theory here is, uh, is important. So uh, the thing is, ideally what I would do is I would like to use resolution, my resolution-based solver for the SAT calls, and I would like to just call uh, the uh, CP, the cutting phase based solver for the last call, right? That would be nice because I would get uh, the efficiency of the solver when you do not require that proof system because the proof system is only uh, important if you, you, if you want to prove unsatisfiability. And uh, the problem is you do not know <laughs> when, uh, is this the last call? You don't know. So, how can we do this? And so Olivier Roussel told me, well, run them in parallel. I say, what? This is, this is stupid, right? I say, well, OK. Uh, and so, so since 2010, typically, I have a solver called Bose uh, in uh, SAT4J, with, which typically run those two solvers in parallel. So what does it mean? It means that when you have this call to is satisfiable here and here, Instead of uh, feeding one solver, I'm feeding two solvers. And I stop, I, I take the solution given by the first one, the first answering, OK? So uh, this is uh, what the cutting planes, so this is for a particular problem uh, in the PB 2010 evaluation. Here is the result of the cutting plane solver is in the uh, output of the uh, resolution solver. So you see here. After one second, it, pro it finds a model with uh, an objective value of 26, 23, 22, 21, 20, 19, 18, and it cannot find optimality, cannot prove optimality. You see that here we have the cutting plane based solvers. It's not very nice, and, uh, but uh, after 25 seconds, it reached 15, which is better than 18. But it cannot prove optimality, OK? So what happens if we have here in parallel? So here you have the cutting planes here. You see that here I give you the, uh, uh, the value on which solvers give the solution, OK? So you see that the first solution is, is given by the cutting plane solver, then resolution solver, then cutting plane solvers. And the optimal solution is found after 300 seconds. So this is a case in which uh, the, uh, there is an interaction. So I, I just take uh, the solution from the first solvers coming, uh, and it works. And uh, I have uh, another case. So typically, uh, we have here uh, cutting planes stopping with, uh, after learning, uh, 226 assignments per second. Okay? This is a deadly slow. Uh, because it should be uh, around uh, 100 thousands normally. But uh, typically, it's very slow with uh, uh, cutting plane. If you look at uh, res parallel CP, uh, typically, the, it will be uh, uh, 4,000, which is not good, but is better than uh, what we have uh, uh, typically here. So th the, 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 the reason why the solver uh, finds something, it's because you uh, it's, it, it doesn't learn a lot of uh, constraints that slows, slows down the solver, okay? Uh, so th uh, this is really the, the way it works. So uh, here you have a comparison with uh, the parallel version here and cutting planes here. 
uh, you see that the parallel version works much better. And here you have the resolution one uh, compared to the parallel one. So here you pay the price, okay, because the, the two servers are running in parallel. Uh, it takes uh, two, twice as much uh, CPU time. So this is the reason why you have this, okay. But uh, it allows you to, to solve uh, a few more problems. So uh, typically, if you, for, for the competition, typically, and uh, this is actually what people use in practice. So in companies, when they, they want to use Sat4j and they want to really prove the sol something, they use the parallel version, okay? Uh, so typically, it works better than uh, any of the, of the two. Uh, so it's twice as slow uh, as the resolution one. So if you do not know, by default, you use the resolution-based uh, solver. And then if you really want to prove optimality, then you can use uh, uh, the both. Um, but what is interesting uh, is th there is that interaction between the two solvers because at any point uh, you, you pick the solution given by the first solvers and uh, so it completely changes the search, okay? Because when you have a resolution or CP, they, they are not uh, having the, the same uh, intermediate uh, constraints and bounds than the, the rest parallel CP. But uh, it's also parallel, so you, when you relaunch it uh, several times, you have concurrent issues, so uh, you have also some issues with reproductibility. Uh, so uh, a few words about uh, the PB evaluation. So uh, the PB evaluation has been organized uh, most uh, for all but one case uh, by Olivier Roussel and Vasco Manquino. Olivier Roussel is uh, from my lab. Uh, uh, Vasco Manquino is uh, from uh, Inesc in Portugal, and uh, they, are, they, they run it from 2005 to 2012. In 2015, it was uh, organized by uh, Norbert Monte, and they organized the last one in 2016. Uh, so there is a, a, a uniform input format, the OPB files, and uh, typically the idea is to regularly, uh, like the site competition, evaluate what are the uh, what is the state of the PB solvers, and uh, you have detailed results on the website. And uh, we will see that uh, there are various technologies, but mainly uh, there have been a, a lot of people working on encodings, and uh, we, there is a weighted Boolean optimization uh, uh, problem, which is typically MaxSat for PB, uh, which exists since uh, 2010. So I gave you the two uh, uh, partial result of the competition to show you, so there are, there are several um, categories, decision problems, optimization with a small, uh, inte small integer means you do not need arbitrary precision arithmetic to solve them, and uh, optimization with big integer, so you need arbitrary precision arithmetic to solve them. So here we have that uh, mini sat plus, so remember that this is typically, and this is from 2005. Minisat Plus didn't change anything since 2005. So this is really uh, 2005 solvers. This is CPLEX, okay? So this is IELP. This is CLASP, which is uh, an ASP solver, but also a, a good uh, uh, SAT solver. Here we, we have the parallel version of uh, SAT4J. Uh, resolution and CP, here we have resolution, and here we have B-Solo, which has been one of the, the, the good optimizers since uh, 97. And we have the solution, either unsat or sat, or either unsat and uh, optimal. Okay, this is proved optimality. Uh, so big integers are not very interesting because there are few solvers competing. So, and you see that uh, for mini sat plus, is uh, good at proving unsatisfiable problem, uh, well, less for, uh, for, for optimal optimization. Uh, CPLEX is very good at solving optimization problem. So here, uh, there are two things. Uh, many of the problems come from MIPLIB. MIPLIB is the repository of benchmarks for CPLEX <laughs> and all ILP solvers. So there is a bit uh, of a bias here, but the point is you need to have those cutting planes rules to be able to solve those optimization problems, okay? So if you do not have them, uh, it doesn't work. So typically, they can do relaxation to LP, 
with uh, real uh, numbers. If you do not have any solution, so this is what they, they do typically here, uh, they will be able to answer on that directly. So they can use a lot of things uh, on that. Minisat plus is, uh, that plus is for what? What is the extra thing there? So, so the Minisat plus is three uh, different encoding for cardinality and uh, pseudo-boolean constraints. So typically it has uh, three different encodings and looking at the constraints, it will uh, uh, translate it into CNF and then it, uh, it uh, launch uh, Minisat. So it has some heuristic to decide then? Yes, so depending on the value of the coefficient, depending on the value of the threshold, it will decide which of the encoding it, it uses. And typically this has been, uh, we will see that uh, there is a, Typically, an improvement uh, uh, on that uh, for the after, but typically this and this was designed in 2005. Okay, there have been no change. Uh, maybe just that it's instead of Minisat uh, 1.13, it's maybe Minisat 2 now. But uh, that's still uh, the technology from 2005, and this is very, this is efficient. Okay. Uh, and you see that in some cases we can decide unsatisfiability here of decision problems, but those are all those uh, um, uh, theoretical pro problems like pigeon also and all those counting problems. So they are not really interesting uh, in practice. And uh, for, for that, it's uh, well, if you have a good Boolean enumerator, it's good. You see that typically CPLEX is not very uh, that good on those decision problems. Okay, but. Uh, where it really shines, it's uh, an optimization problem because it can use everything. If you take, so this is the last uh, PB16 evaluation. Uh, so look at the numbers. Still, the old Minisat Plus uh, performed very well. Uh, so you have much more benchmarks. They typically took all the benchmarks available that year. Yeah. And um, you see here, uh, Set4j only the par parallel versions. Here you have CDCLCP, which is a, a former version of rounding SAT uh, so that I uh, show you. So you see that it typically uses the same uh, thing as in uh, SAT4J in that version. So the CP is for, stands for cutting planes, but this is not the real cutting plane. This is general resolution implemented in C++. And you see that this is the, the best uh, thing that can work. <coughs> and for the mini SAT plus for the satisfiable problems. Uh, and we, it f performs very well on optimization problems, uh, on unsat problems for uh, when you have small integers, uh, and it didn't support uh, arbitrary uh, precision arithmetic, but it would be as good if it uh, would. Um, and then you have NAPS. NAPS is typically a Nagoya pseudo boolean solvers. This is typically also encoding and then using uh, a set solver behind. So this is just, so those two solvers do not know anything about PB. They just see clauses. Well, yes, they do the translation from pseudo boolean constraint to uh, CNF. But typically the solver itself doesn't have any hints about what is a PB, a PB constraint. And you see that the results are pretty good. Okay, uh, let's see uh, how it goes. So I would like just to show you um, uh, something about calinity detection and then the limit uh, of why we have problems with uh, uh, pseudo boolean solvers. So I, I, I try to convince you that there are problems that are inherent to the implementation and there are also problems in the theory. Okay. Okay, cardinality detection. Uh, so we have that, uh, so this is a, a paper we published uh, uh, five years ago. Um, we, we, I show you in the very first slide that you can retrieve uh, cardinality constraint from CNF, okay? This is uh, the, uh, what I call uh, theoretical computer science cutting planes proof system where you do that systematic way of arranging uh, clauses and you can retrieve those uh, things. But typically, none of the PB solvers using some implementation of cutting planes can work on CNF, okay? So the idea is, uh, uh, can we find something uh, to help PB solvers to work on CNF? And we want something that is general. We, we don't want to 
uh, use uh, some kind of pattern matching on, uh, on the syntactical form of the CNF. We want something that may work uh, in the general case. So can, what, what can we do? So w one thing is, if we can do that, we can reduce uh, really the number of uh, uh, the size of the problem. So th this is a, a, a case of cryptographic uh, benchmarks. By default, you have uh, 500,000 uh, clauses. Okay? If you translate it into uh, OPB, here are the, the, the size of the constraints, and this is the value of the threshold, which, which means uh, less or equal to 1, less or equal to 2, less or equal to 3, less or equal to 4. Uh, and this is the number of literals uh, you have. And typically, you go from 5, 500,000 clauses to uh, a bit more than uh, 120,000 clauses. Size of the constraints is 3 means what? And there are 3 constraints. Uh, so, here, threshold is k, yeah. and size is the number of literals on the, on the right-hand side. So, for instance, if you have, here it means you have it's uh, x1 plus x2 plus x3 uh, less or equal to 1. Uh, x1 plus x2 plus x3 plus x4 less or equal to 2. So, it's the number of literals on the left-hand side. So, typically, it means that those are very small uh, cardinality constraints, uh, but still, it allows to reduce the number of uh, constraints by a factor of four. Uh, if you take, uh, so typically, uh, we will do that also uh, this afternoon in the under session. If you take uh, a pigeon hole, so this is with 100 pigeons, so this is way too large for, we could take 20 or 16, it, it, 19, it will be already a, a problem, but so it doesn't work. If you use, uh, a general re resolution on this, it doesn't work. But now it's less than one second if you use the general resolution. So the, this is really the, the problem. If, if you do not have the right representation, you cannot use uh, the proof system we have just shown. So how to do this? So th the thing is, uh, we, we, we have that fact that we can replace really uh, a huge amount of clause by a single constraint, so that's good. But the problem is, uh, and we can use the, the proof system, but the problem is in practice, so it's not easy to uh, detect all the encodings. So one of the reasons was explained by Mate yesterday. Some of the encodings are, are consistent, others are not. If you are not are consistent, there is uh, typically no way you are going to retrieve the, the thing. Uh, but we are going to, to try to do it. Um, and uh, so, here are a few uh, encodings, uh, so typically for, from uh, uh, the most well-known, but uh, th there are regularly new ones, and so there are many. Um, what we want is to have, uh, if, we need, if we do it syntactically, we would need to recognize each encoding, and this is something we do not want, right? So if we want to do some uh, semantic detection, we want to use unit propagation because this is something uh, that works well in the solver. And typically, it should work on any encoding that preserve uh, a consistency. And typically, it might be the case that people wrote constraints in the, uh, for their problems and that there are hidden cardinality constraints inside, things that they, they just cardinality that can be inferred from uh, the, the other ones. So that would be the, the thing. So how uh, are we going to, to proceed? In some ways, it will be similar to what we have done by end. It means that we are going to uh, take uh, a clause. Uh, so we are trying to retrieve at most k constraint, right? Um, and so we are, we are going to translate our clause in that uh, format, which is sum of the negated value uh, of x1 uh, less or equal to n minus 1. So typically, binary clause will be less or equal to 1. Okay? And then, typically, what we are going to do, we are going to try to extend to add literals here and without changing at all uh, the, the threshold. 
So the point is we will start with binary clauses because here the threshold will be one. Once we are done with binary clauses, we'll do ternary clauses and so on. So we can, that way it means we can try to detect at most one, at most two, at most, and that is uh, just uh, uh, a way to, to do it. So how can we do that? Typically, uh, what we, we have this formula and what we want to find is to, to find that uh, x1 plus x2 plus x3 is less or equal to one, okay? So here you have, uh, we have x1 and x2 are mutually exclusive. There should be uh, by here uh, x1, x3 that are mutually exclusive. So you see you need to resolve the two to get the information. It, by just syntactical uh, information, I won't get it. And uh, I have uh, x3, uh, x2, uh, which is available here also if you, unipro if you resolve that one and that one, okay? So, so it means there is really an encoding, which is a bit hidden, but uh, of x1, x2, or x3, uh, that, that should be less or equal to one. So what do I do? I take the first uh, binary clause, and now I'm going to propagate x1, and I'm going to uh, propagate x2. So, th so this uh, constraint, it's exactly uh, that one, okay? Because here it's negated, uh, then I, I, I find negating twice, I get this. So now I'm propagating by, so this is unit propagation uh, on x1. So I'm going to propagate, if I propagate x1, I'm getting not x2. By not x2, uh, I have nothing else. Then I have not x4. Uh, not x4, I have not x3, okay? So this is what I get if I propagate x1. Now I'm going to propagate x2. If I propagate x2, uh, I'm going to propagate not x1. Uh, I will get uh, not x5, and so I, I will get not x3. So now I'm going to take the intersection of the two, and the intersection will be uh, not x3. So what does it mean? It means that I can add uh, here x3, the negation, uh, to this cardinality constraint. And this is how the, the process works. So I started with this. I have the intersection. I could add all the elements that in the intersection to this uh, constraint. So this is how it works. So you, you choose uh, what is uh, your, typically your constraint, and uh, you, you start by uh, having your element with uh, all the elements that are in, uh, uh, in your cardinality constraint. And then you have for each subset of K, and this is where it's painful. So <laughs> there it's combinatoric, right? And then you, you have to check on to do the intersection. And if you take all the, the intersection of all those elements, and you can add them to uh, the, uh, the constraints. So it's easy for one, for two, and when k grows, uh, it's just uh, a nightmare, OK? OK, how does it work? Uh, so typically, Lingeling has a dedicated syntactical uh, recognition of uh, cardinality constraints because it allows uh, it to solve more benchmarks at the side competition, so <laughs> it was used for that. Um, so there is uh, another syntactical one that was uh, present in Norbert uh, Monte uh, RIS solver. And so in, uh, SAT, in SAT4J, we uh, uh, we use the cutting plane version with and without preposition. And there is also uh, SBSAT, which used uh, uh, by compilation uh, some uh, uh, detection of KNT constraints. So uh, here, so we are using general resolution. So uh, these are a different representation of uh, the constraints, okay? So we have different uh, encodings. So pairwise is the what we, we have seen this morning. And then there are different ones, uh, okay? Uh, so we have Lingeling, which can find the classical one very easily. So here we have the syntactical uh, recognition of risk, and then we use SAT4J. Here we have the semantical representation that it is implemented very efficiently in risk, and that we feed the SAT4J. Here we have uh, SBSAT, or we have uh, SAT4J without preprocessing. 
Okay, you see that that project without preprocessing cannot do anything. You see that so in bold you have the good results. So it means that yes, you can retrieve the pairwise. So for some reason here uh, it uh, it takes time. So I don't know why, but it, it's a bit strange. But okay, it, it works. Uh, typically, it works fine with SAT4J uh, CP, or the, who you will see this afternoon. And, and you, you see that we can retrieve for many of them uh, the, uh, the encoding. So, the, so this was sort of, a, uh, so Lingeling works very well for the pairwise encoding, and uh, SBSAT has good results for the ladder encoding, uh, and uh, SAT4J doesn't work without preprocessing, and then we are, we are good on some uh, of the encodings. So, but these are very, uh, so those were pigeon hole principles with those encodings. Those are very uh, 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 crafted benchmarks, okay? Uh, what we tried is to have, so those are other crafted benchmarks from the theoretical computer science community, uh, but we, we were interested to see if we can solve all of them. So they are all based on uh, counting principle, at least one, at least two, at least three. Uh, at most one, at most uh, two, at most three. Uh, so you have, to, and you see that in t all those cases, we could uh, retrieve them, okay? So those are typically the, uh, but because they are all based on this uh, uh, pairwise encoding. Now, what is uh, more interesting, we wanted to check how good is the uh, detection of uh, kinetic constraints. So typically we took some pseudo grids, nine by nine and uh, 16 by 16, and we could retrieve, uh, so with the syntactic, we couldn't get all the, the kinetic constraints, but we could get all of them with the semantic uh, detection. And there was a, uh, a challenge benchmark by uh, Spence and Van Gelder, so this is typically a problem on which CLASP, which is very efficient, uh, tried to run during 24 hours and couldn't solve it. And this is solved within a second if you know how to count. So typically it shows you that there are many benchmarks from the, the SAT competition that are typically counting problems just there to, because it's known that a SAT solver cannot count, right? And uh, so this is quite easy if you know how to do it. And it, this uh, belongs to Atmos 3 constraints. So neither Armin nor uh, Norbert with risk can do it because it's uh, uh, Atmos 1 or Atmos 2 for risk. But uh, with our generic thing, it works. Um, okay, and so now, yes. So uh, what about if you, uh, can you use the same idea for Sudoku? So it's, it, it, it would work exactly the same uh, with uh, pseudo boolean constraints. So if that, you, you that, can that do the, the propagation. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, you, even with XOR, with whatever. Because you only rely on the fact that when you propagate something, you just take the intersection of the propagation. So you could have whatever constraints you want. Then I'm not sure it's re it really matters uh, to do this if you already have cardinality constraints. Because typically the propagation is much uh, more, it's, it's much slower on uh, the PB and, and the kinetic constraints. So you need something. So here you do it because it just closes and this is quick. But so uh, yeah, in practice you could use any kind of constraint. Okay, so now there is a reason why we have difficulties because typically, uh, so I would like, uh, so, Mate didn't want to show you our work uh, <laughs> conflict analysis in the solver, so I have a, a small one. Uh, let me see. So, th this, is, this is what happens if we uh, uh, do conflict analysis in, uh, in SAT4J typically. So, um, we have uh, this is falsified, this is propagated. So, because this one is falsified, you have to propagate this. Uh, if you propagate this, this is falsified, uh, and uh, this is falsified also. Uh, so here you will need to propagate uh, X to false, uh, and uh, because X is uh, falsified, now you are going to falsify X3. Okay. 
So what we have, uh, so, so Kappa 3 is, uh, uh, is uh, falsified. So now you, we need to do uh, a clashing addition between uh, Kappa 3 and Kappa 2. And we're going to just trust me on, on that case, but uh, uh, we should be able uh, to do it uh, because it's, uh, uh, so we have to multiply this one by three, okay? So we have uh, 12 plus one, uh, 13, uh, six plus one, seven, six plus nothing is six. We have D here, we have E here, and we have, uh, uh, here we have uh, 15 plus 19 minus uh, three, so it's 16, okay? So we have uh, this formula, and uh, we, uh, we learn these constraints, and uh, if we remove, uh, if we falsify A, what we have here is uh, only 15, so you need to propagate A at decision level zero, okay? So this is another case where you just uh, um, erase all the decisions, you come back to decision zero, and you are going to propagate. And this is, you cannot see that in a SAT solver. This is not possible. You cannot, you, in, what happens in a SAT solver, you, f you replace one decision by your propagation, but you, you do not back jump uh, up to uh, the last decision level. Okay, so uh, this is this uh, constraints, but if you look at it, uh, we have those two guys, D and E. They are not related, so, I, ca I could get rid of them because uh, if I, s I want to s have 16, it can be uh, A and B, can be uh, A and C, but uh, there is no other way. Uh, D and E do not play any role in the fact that you satisfy them. So actually, so we call them irrelevant. They're irrelevant, this is what we have seen. So what we should have instead of this, we should have this. What does it mean? It means that what we learn when we use those uh, rules that I showed you earlier, we are producing things that are not as tight uh, as uh, what you learn with, with uh, clauses, typically. So we, are, we, so we are using, we are learning things. So D and E were not useless in uh, the original constraints, but when we combine them, they become useless. So this is, a, this is a first problem. Okay, suppose. And uh, yes, we could even change the uh, here the degree. So here it's uh, 16. I could replace the degree by 14. That would be the same constraint. Yes? So how do you define, um, define irrelevant and how do you test for it? <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I, I understand kind of the So this is idea. an NPR problem <laughs> to detect if, if a literal is irrelevant or not. It's NPR. But what is kind of the formal definition? I, I kind of get the So the, 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 the definition, if, uh, if, uh, restrict, if you satisfy or, or, or falsified uh, D, or if you forget D, you have exactly the uh, an equivalent formula in terms of forgetting, if you know what forgetting is. So typically, if you, uh, if you satisfy or falsify uh, that value, you have uh, an equivalent formula. And uh, you wonder, does it happen in practice? Okay, so it doesn't happen, they, are, they do not appear in the original problems, okay? But in SAT4J, uh, this is a, we, we took many benchmarks from uh, the 2016 uh, evaluation, and uh, we, we check the number of irrelevant literals in the first 5,000 uh, constraints, so we dump the, five, uh, the first 5,000 constraints we learned in SAT4J, and we tried to look how many uh, irrelevant literals we have. And uh, we, you, you can see that we have, so here you have the number of instances, and uh, here you have the number of uh, irrelevant uh, uh, literals in the instances. And so in some instances, you can have up to 10,000 literals, irrelevant literals on the 5,000 uh, constraints. So it's, uh, you have a few, and then you could think, well, maybe that brand new uh, running SAT solver from Jacob Nortrum 
and young alphas could solve the problem, okay? So in that case, what they do is that they, when they do the, uh, uh, they, they use the, the division rules, that one here, uh, in, instead of saturation. And so uh, we can take another example. And here, in that case, uh, we falsify kappa 3. And th what they will do is they will take kappa 2. And uh, because we, uh, we are going to weaken on E, because this is where we have to, uh, to reason. So it removes E. And then you, uh, so it's on, uh, we have to, to do it on A, right? So we're going to divide here because, so we weaken on E, E disappeared, we have this formula. Now we are going to resolve on A, so we divide all the, the constraint by the coefficient of A. So we, we get a close, okay? And if that uh, case, so typically uh, C and D here were irrelevant. Because here you have coefficient three, coefficient three, and so if you want to satisfy that constraint, you should either use A or B, because you remember that if you take, because they have the same coefficient, they are uh, sort of equivalent, okay? And C and D have the same coefficient one, they are also equivalent, but in that case, they are just irrelevant. And because now it divided by three, uh, that value, they all, have the same uh, coefficient, so now C and D become relevant, okay? So what does it mean? It means that uh, they could have learned A plus B greater than one if at this stage they knew that C plus D were irrelevant, but they didn't know, so they get a much weaker constraint. And so there are also some cases, much less than in SAT4J, but there are cases in which they have irrelevant literals. So uh, this is uh, really the, um, uh, so, and what is this a big issue in practice? So this is the, an example th that we have. So typically, the issue is you, we could, because those are irrelevant, uh, we could get rid of those elements and we could reduce if we, because we can choose by which value we, uh, because their value doesn't change the, uh, the satisfiability of the constraint. So we can change to uh, satisfy them and then to reduce the degree. Then it means that we, will, we can have it here 15. So we can use saturation to uh, remove the 17 and to have 15 here. And now you see that we can divided by five, and this is preserving because we didn't use ceiling, okay? So this is equivalent preserving. And so we can, instead of this, we could have this. And uh, this is, we have that issue with the coefficient growing. If we are able to detect this, uh, we are happy, right? So typically, uh, this is one of the, the reasons. And we have also the, the fact that we, we may hide cadenity constraints, so here, uh, you, e and F are irrelevant. If you know that they are irrelevant, uh, you, you can divide it by, you can divide everything by three, so here you will get two, and that will be also uh, much better, okay? So, we, are, we do not have any solution for the moment, but the thing is, we know that uh, even all the rules where we know, we are aware, aware of, there is that issue with irrelevant literals that doesn't happen, neither for closes nor for uh, cardinality constraints. But it only appears because of the fact that not all literals are equivalent in uh, PB constraints. And so this is something uh, we are working on it. Uh, and, uh, and so it means until we solve this, there is, we will have problems to uh, incorporate uh, uh, a good proof system in our solvers because we are we are producing constraints that are too weak for uh, the thing. Okay, so uh, so typically, yeah, 
uh, here we can we could have used instead of uh, PB uh, PB representation a canonity representation which is more efficient but then we do not have it so I would like to start the second lecture 